Welcome to the Boardwalk Talks program brought to you by the Alabama Aquarium at the Dauphin Island Sea Lab. My name is Mendel Graber. I'm one of the educators here at the lab. And this week we are celebrating National Estuaries Week. Um, Mobile Bay, which you can see behind me, is an estuary. An estuary is a place where fresh water and salt water meet and mix in a semi-enclosed basin. So to give you a bigger picture of Mobile Bay, um, this is Mobile Bay. Here is Dauphin Island, the location of the Dauphin Island Sea Lab. And so here you see Mobile Bay and there's salt water from the Gulf of Mexico flowing into the bay and fresh water from the rivers and streams of the Mobile Bay watershed flowing into the bay. And this place where they meet and mix is an estuary. So, good morning. So I'm gonna hand this to you guys so you can see a map of where we are. And I mentioned the watershed of Mobile Bay so a watershed is an area of land that drains to a particular body of water. So we were talking about the Mobile Bay Estuary being a place where fresh water and salt water mix. So the salt water is coming from the Gulf of Mexico. The fresh water is coming from all of these rivers and streams that you see um, outlined in green on this map. So if you want to find a watershed for a particular body of water. You can start at that water body, Mobile Bay right here, and you find all the rivers and streams that are emptying into it, and you can trace them back to their beginnings. And the land that those rivers and streams drain is the watershed. So you can see that it is sort of funnel shaped. There's a lot of land area that is draining to a relatively smaller um, area right here. So every day, on average, billions and billions of gallons of fresh water flows into Mobile Bay from the, um, from the mainland. And so an estuary like Mobile Bay is a very important nursery ground. There are a lot of baby animals that can find food and shelter habitat in an estuary system. So estuaries in our part of the world in temperate climates um, have salt marshes associated with them. So we are standing in front of a salt marsh right here, this grassy area. Salt marshes are kind of like grassy meadows right at the edge of land and sea. So they are in the intertidal zone. That's the area between high tide and low tide. And if you can see how dense this grass is, and imagine the water flowing in to that grassy area with the tide. That is a really good place for a lot of small animals to hide. They can swim in among those grasses. And um, a lot of the bigger animals that might eat them cannot follow them into there. So they can find plenty of hiding places in there. So, I went out to the marsh yesterday with a group and we collected some things and then I went back this morning and collected a, a few more things to bring and show you from the salt marsh. Um, so I'm going to first tell you about the grasses. We have two dominant kinds of grasses in our salt marshes and um, they're very obviously dominant. This is a, a small area of marsh but if you uh, see a bigger area of marsh if you drove did you guys drive onto the island or did you ride the ferry so it you might have noticed as you were leaving the mainland and crossing over the bridge an area of grass right at the edge of the land and the sea that's salt marsh so the two dominant grasses of the salt marsh are smooth cord grass so you guys can feel that if you want to and black needle rush. And this is the taller grass, 
grass that has the round um, grass blade, the rush, and it is very sharp. It's called needle rush for a reason. Um, so you can test that out if you want to and, and poke yourself gently with it. Don't poke anyone else though. Yeah, it's called black needle rush. And so a uh, salt marsh can be, uh, it, it presents some challenges for plants because that water is salty. And a lot of plants are not well adapted for living in salty environments. Also, the water with the tides comes and goes, so it's a changing environment. Um, the salinity, the saltiness of the water changes depending on how much rain uh, is, how much fresh water is coming into that area from all over the watershed. So it's, it can be kind of a hard place for a lot of plants to live, but those grasses are well adapted to thrive in that environment. Now, one of the other things about salt marshes is that they grow on low energy protected shorelines. Um, because they grow in that intertidal zone where the waves are coming in. So, um, Dauphin Island, this is another picture of Dauphin Island that's kind of zoomed in closer. Uh, the Gulf of Mexico is on the south side of Dauphin Island. And that side of the island gets bigger waves. There are, um, you know, hurricanes or tropical storms that hit the island. And usually that energy is coming from the south, from the Gulf of Mexico. And it hits the south side of Dauphin Island. And the north side of Dauphin Island is more protected. It's more sheltered. It's sheltered by the island itself. And so you, the waves on the north side are not as big. So that is typically where we find salt marshes, is on lower energy shorelines. So those plants that you guys are checking out are well adapted to thrive in those, that kind of environment. And when you get those grasses growing right at the shore, that is a salt marsh ecosystem and remember I said that's a really good place for small animals to hide. So I have brought some of the small animals that hide in the salt marsh. Um, some of those animals are babies and they may grow bigger while they're living in the marsh and then they may leave that salt marsh and go out into the Mobile Bay, into the estuary system and they may grow even more out there and then they might go out into the Gulf of Mexico, out into the ocean. Or some of these animals will stay small their whole lives and they, and they live their whole lives in the salt marsh. So one example of a salt marsh animal that stays in the marsh for its whole life, I'm gonna show folks who are tuning in and then I'll show it to you guys. This is a little fiddler crab and you can see that I'm cupping my hand around it so I'm not trying to um, hide it from you, but they are not, they don't aggressively defend themselves with their claws the way some crabs do. They run and hide. So when I open my hand to show it to you, um, I'll, be have, I'll have to be careful that I don't let it run and, and fall off of my hand. So I'm going to do that carefully. Um, try to hold it gently by its legs. And Fiddler crabs get the name Fiddler crab because the males, the boys, have one big claw and one small claw. Oh, Can you see one big claw and one small claw? That means he's I'm going to show the folks who may be watching at home. One big claw, one small claw. And when they eat, they eat uh, from the mud. So look at this mud, this rich marsh mud. If you guys would like to feel it, you are welcome to stick your finger in there and feel it. Marsh mud itself is pretty silky smooth, but this mud has a little sand mixed into it. So it can be, you can feel kind of the grit of the sand. But what makes this so dark and rich, Oh wow. 
Yeah, is the decaying plant matter well, from those grasses. Go ahead. Very soft. So, it? not those grasses are very high in cellulose. Well, it it's not easy yeah. for many animals to digest that grass. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, not many animals eat the grass while it's alive. But then when the grass dies um, and starts to decompose, then microbes are breaking it down. It's, it's getting kind of partially digested. Then uh, a lot of animals will eat that broken down um, plant matter, including the little fiddler crabs. So I had started to tell you why they're called fiddler crabs, and I had to explain the mud before I could get around to the, the way they eat. But the fiddler crabs eat the decaying plant matter out of the mud, um, but they don't want to eat all that sand. So did you guys notice the grittiness in there that was the sand mixed in? So they will put that mud in their mouths and then they'll use their, the different mouth parts that they have to turn that mud around and they swallow all that yummy decaying plant matter and they'll spit the sand out. So when you go to the marsh and you can see fiddler crab burrows, there are little balls all around their burrows from where they have spit that sand out. But the males only use their smaller claw to put the mud into their mouths. Their big claw just kind of rests there while they're eating so it looks like they're playing a fiddle. So that's how fiddler crabs get the name fiddler crab. So they eat little bites of mud. Another um, marsh animal that I have collected, and if you guys would like to hold one, I'll hand you each one of these. These are, can you look at it and guess what kind of animal this is? Any guesses? It is a snail. So these are called marsh periwinkles. Yeah. And they um, are typically found on or around the grasses. So I pulled those off of the grasses this morning. And these um, uh, snails will crawl up out of the water when the tide comes in. They will crawl up onto the grasses out of the water. You see how the grass is sticking up out of the water? It's not completely covered by water. So why do you think they crawl up out of the water? Why do you think they, when the tide comes in, they might go up out of the water? How many guesses? Some? Sometimes people think it's so they don't drown or so they don't wash away. Sometimes people think it's because um, they might be uh, uh, sensitive to the salt. But in fact, because these grasses are growing in salt water, they're taking up salt water, they will excrete salt and the blades of these grasses can be covered in salt crystals. So it's not salt, it's not oxygen. But yeah, and if you hold it, it will crawl around on your hand. You can make friends with a periwinkle snail this morning. Um, but there is a predator of these snails that will come in with the tide. It is a water animal, a swimming animal, and it's bigger. So it's big enough to crush the shells of these snails and eat them. And so blue crabs will eat periwinkle snails. Yeah. So that's a, f a food source for the blue crab, but the periwinkle doesn't, doesn't want to be eaten. So um, you know they are going to crawl up the grasses to avoid the blue crabs. Uh, sometimes we find periwinkle snails with scars on their shells where um, they may have been uh, they may have, yeah, they may have had a blue crab that crunched their shell. This might be a blue crab skull right here, this line so that you can see. They do, uh, and it takes a pretty big blue crab to to 
um, crush a, a shell like this is a pretty good protection. And there are a lot of baby blue crabs in the marsh. A lot of baby blue crabs live in a salt marsh and they find habitat as babies as well. But um, the, it's the bigger blue crabs that might be able to crush these shells. But sometimes the, the snails will survive having their shell crunched a little bit. And so here's a, a follow-up question for you. When these snails grow, do they leave their shells behind or do their shells grow with them? So if their shell got crunched by a crab but the snail survived, would they go find a new shell and leave that one behind? You say no? You're right. The snail's shells grow with them. So if they survived that um, crab attack, they might be able to um, heal that uh, cracked shell. Like sometimes people get broken bones and then their bones get set and their bodies will heal those breaks. So as our bodies will um, lay down mineral material for our bones, the snails lay down mineral material for their shells. And I don't know if the slime on my finger is visible uh, to the camera. Um, do you guys notice the slime? So snails move with a suction cup foot. Put your hand out so you don't drop in. Mm-hmm. And they make that slime to make it easier for them to move. Have you ever played with a suction cup? Have you ever taken a suction cup and stuck it to glass? If you want to put it in a really specific spot and, and you want to be able to move it after you stick it, you might lick that suction cup before you stick it onto the glass, right? Because that will allow you to slide it. Um, so that is kind of like the snails making slime. It allows them to slide along on their suction cup foot so without letting go. Another thing that you guys can notice are the little antennae or eye stalks. Do you see those? And the eyes are not at the very tips of those eye stalks. You could actually follow those um, little antennae towards their bodies and maybe spot their little eyes. And another thing that you might um, notice is that they will touch you with their antennae. Do you see them touching you like this? So snails have little sensory organs in the ends of those antennae. And it's a little bit like a sense of taste. You know, if you took your tongue and you touched it to a potato chip, how, what would you notice about it? What's, what do you notice when you lick a potato chip? Is it salty? Is the potato chip salty? But when you touch it with your finger, you don't feel the saltiness, do you? So that's kind of your chemical sensory organ, your tongue. So these antennae are, we wouldn't call them tongues necessarily, but it has a, a similar kind of sensory organ to our tongues. All right, if you guys want to put the snails down, you can, or you can hold on to them. We will talk about a couple of other things as well. So, one of the animals that people might, might see more often, girls, can you, um, do you, would you like to come and take a look at this animal? It's not a snail. What is, no, not this one, but the one I'm holding. So what is this? Can you tell? Look at this one. How does that look different than the snails? It's a crab. What, do you know what kind of crab it is? It's called a hermit crab. And so this animal moves with legs instead of the little suction cups. But um, what kind of animal made the shell that this crab is in? What do you think? Do their shells look similar? Do the shells look similar, even though the animals look different? Mm -hmm. So the hermit crabs live in snail shells. Mm -hmm. And this hermit crab is living in a periwinkle snail shell. 
So when the snails die, their bodies, the soft part of their bodies, rots, decomposes, and it leaves the shell behind. I'll take that one. Would you like to hold the hermit crab? And... Does he bite? No, they don't bite. You want to turn your hand over? And, um... And the shell is left behind. Would you like to hold one? Sort of like some animals leave bones behind after they die. Would you like to hold one? And... Then snails might move into the empty, I mean, uh, hermit crabs might move into the empty snail shells. This is a bigger hermit crab. Yeah. Yeah, let me borrow this one for just a second so we can show the size difference. It's the same kind of hermit crab. These are the same species of hermit crab. But when the hermit crabs outgrow these shells, and periwinkles are not a very big species of snail, so they don't make very big shells, um, then these, her these hermit crabs may have to find a different kind of snail shell. So that hermit crab is in a shell from an oyster drill snail, a different kind of snail. That's really cool. All right, so we sort of talked about this crab as a predator of the snails, but I want to show you a couple of other things about this um, specimen that I have. It's not alive, but it's not dead. So here's a conundrum. It's not alive, but it's not dead. So what do you think you're looking at? Any idea? Let me do this. Whoa. Yeah. It's not dead. Um, it does look dead. You can smell it. It doesn't smell like a rotten, dead, rotten meat. There's no meat in here. So this crab shed its exoskeleton and it went away. When cra This is a molt. So when crabs grow, they will grow a new exoskeleton inside their old one because they can't just leave this behind and, and not have anything to hold all their parts in. in. Um, and they do want to leave this one behind. So instead of growing a new exoskeleton on the outside, they grow it on the inside, inside their old one. And it's bigger. So how does it fit on the inside? It's soft at first. So then it will split open the seam on the back and it'll wiggle out and over a day or so it'll take in some water and kind of puff up its new soft ex exoskeleton kind of like if you blew up an inner tube you know if you fill it up with air um, it gets bigger so that gives them some growing room and then their new exoskeleton will harden up if you've ever eaten soft shell crabs a soft shell crab is a crab right after it has molted and its new exoskeleton hasn't yet hardened up. So this one is so fresh that the legs, the joints are still flexible on most of them. The claw on this one has started to stiffen up. So as the exoskeleton dries, this molt dries, uh, the joints will stiffen. But if you guys would like to feel it and take a look at it, you can take the, this part of the crab is called a carapace. And um, you're going to hold that. And another thing that you can notice about the molts, it's kind of hard to see because the eyes can fit into these little sockets. But on a molt, the coverings over the eyes are clear and there are no eyeballs in there. When the crab left and left its exoskeleton behind, it took its eyeballs with it. That's probably so good. these are clear. If you can take a close look at that, you might be able to see it. And then these are the coverings over its gills. Do you guys know what an animal does with gills? Yes, they you do. Think about uh -huh. it. A water animal yeah. has gills, and what do they use them for? Breathing. They, breathing. That's right. They use them for breathing. But the crab also took its gills with it. So those are the coverings, just like the coverings sure. over there. You're welcome to hold it. Would you like to hold it? There's no crab in there. It's just it's, um, it's hard and smooth. 
Yeah. And sometimes we call it call them no shells. Skeleton. So you could kind of think of this That's as a shell, but it's different than a snail shell. Yeah. So we we technically call them exoskeletons. That's Exo means outside, so it's an outside skeleton. All right, so I brought another couple of animals that I'll show you. Um, Gentle, hold it with two hands. That's cool. Yeah. Nope, thank you. So in here, I have, it's, it's very hard to see. Do you see anything swimming around in there? It's very hard to see because they're clear. And so I am going to pull it out. Sometimes it is hard for me to hold on to these tiny things so that I have a good grip on them and so that you can see them. Um, so I am going to hold this little shrimp. This is called a grass shrimp. We can put it down. Thank you. This is called a grass shrimp. Why do you think it's called a grass shrimp? Let me show it to folks watching at home. They're so clear, you can see through them. You can see that? I'm holding her very gently by her head. If you've ever eaten shrimp, the part that we eat is the muscular tail, this part, and they jump with those tails. So if you've seen a live shrimp moving, oh, she's jumping. So the reason I'm holding her by her head really gently is because if she starts trying to move, jumping with her tail, um, I won't drop her. And she's okay. When I put her down, she'll swim, she'll jump, she'll be just fine. I know this is a girl, a, a she, because she has eggs. So even though this shrimp is very tiny, it is a full-grown mama shrimp. And I can tell that because she has eggs. So do you see this little brown on her tail? Those are her eggs. So the brown, she's holding with her swimmerettes, um, her back legs. I'm going to give her a little breath. Um, and so these are small, small shrimp that live in the marshes, in the grasses, and that shallow water is a really good habitat for them. All right, so did you guys get a good look at her or would you like to put her in here with a little bit of water and you can take a little closer look at her. There's another grass shrimp in there or another shrimp um, that does not have eggs but you can look at them both together. Uh, she's in that container right there. But remember they jump so they do sometimes, uh-huh, they do sometimes escape. Um, and we'll try not to drop her. Um, they're both in that container right there. So the last animal that I want to tell you about, do you guys know what this is? We call those shells on our beach, didn't we? Do you know what they are? You're welcome to feel it. Let me just caution you that parts of it are sharp, so be careful feeling it. Do you know what they are? They're called oysters. And oysters are, ri oh, there's a little hermit crab hiding in the, hiding in the, hiding in the oyster. So I was about to say that oysters are really important um, ecologically. That means um, they're an important part of our estuary system and they, provide habitat. They serve as habitat for a lot of different kinds of animals. So oysters like to attach to hard things. They might attach to a dock or rocks that are out in the water. They attach to other oysters. And when lots of oysters attach to each other, they serve as a reef. So even a really small clump of oysters like this is sort of like an apartment building. So we have some um, these were bigger oysters that died, and I can tell that they died because their second shell is missing. But they have some live baby oysters attached to them. So that's what you're feeling right there. There are more here. There is uh, one that attached and grew a little bit and then died before it got big. 
They also have barnacles attached to them. So these are related to crabs. They also have algae on them. So they're providing um, a place for that algae to live as well. Oysters also, oyster shells also. There is, it's, it's kind of hard to tell what this is, but you can see kind of like a crust mm -hmm. on this oyster shell. It's darker than where you see the shell exposed. That is a colonial animal called bryozoa. When I say colonial, it, that animal lives kind of um, connected to other animals of its kind. Um, and there are little crabs that will, will live in the cracks and crevices of the oysters. Like you saw that hermit crab hiding in there, little fish, worms that will live in the shell, kind of like some worms will dig in the ground, some worms will dig in shells. Uh, or some worms will make their own little tubes on top of the shells, on the outside of the shells. So lots and lots and lots of different kinds of animals live on and around oyster shells. And if you guys would like to hold that, you're welcome to hold it and take a closer look. I have a question. So that one is kind of like a little apartment complex. And a big oyster reef is sort of like a city. And they're really important habitat. Yeah. I took a tour uh -huh. in a group in a little dolphin. Mm -hmm. The only time I'd seen this was low tide. Oysters were stacked on mm -hmm. top of each other and they were spitting. Oh. Yeah, and I didn't have my camera with me. What were they doing? Well, they may have been releasing eggs and sperm into the water. Oh. So they're broadcast spawners. Mm -hmm. So they're attached to something so they can't um, you know, move around, mm -hmm. and so they will kind of broadcast their eggs and sperm into the water, and they, you know, will be fertilized in the water. And then oysters will go through a planktonic larval phase mm -hmm. where they're drifting in the currents, and then they will settle down um, and, and attach to something. Mm -hmm. Finally, I have an answer. So having something hard to attach to um, can help prevent them from getting covered by mud or sand because they're filter feeders and so they need um, the water to flow through. They'll open up and you know the current will flow through and they can filter food out of the water. But if they get buried, um, either when they settle and they they are unlucky enough to settle in a bad spot where they're in soft sediment and get covered up or if they get covered by something like a hurricane that stirs sediment and and washes it over them they can't move themselves to get unburied mm -hmm. so um you know they they are they are attracted to hard things and that's where they will succeed best surviving do you guys have any questions about any of these things? You are welcome to take a closer look at any of the plants or animals or mud that I brought out. Um, there is actually a molt from a different kind of crab. And I had one of these crabs that I caught this morning to show both the live crab and the molt. It look, I'll hand it to you in just a second. It looks a lot like a fiddler crab, but it is a different kind of crab. But they're pretty good at climbing, and I think it might have climbed up my grass. This one? Yeah. Um, or maybe it's just hiding in one of these buckets and I haven't seen it yet. You guys are welcome to take a closer look. And those of you who are watching at home, um, happy National Estuaries Week. Thank you for joining us and learning about the importance of estuaries and learning about our estuary, Mobile Bay. My finger's wet.